This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay, let me remind you of verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's Revelation 22 and verse 13. Christ is the beginning and the end. That's the first letter in the Greek alphabet, Alpha. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Jesus is the first and the last. He is the initiator, and he, he is the finisher. He brought all things into uh, fruition, and he will, at his coming, bring things to an end. And he says in verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Here again, I think, is a, is a proof that what we're talking about in the book of Revelation is not our future eternal abode with God in heaven, although many of the aspects of these things that are described will be true in a certain sense. What he's describing for us here is the holy city, the bride of Christ, which is the church. That's what this is a description of. And those who wash their robes are those who have been baptized into Christ. Take a look at our, our illustration. As you enter the city, you gain entrance into that city through the blood of Christ. Throughout this series, we have used Lonnie Woodruff's artwork, and I'm very heavily dependent upon Brother Woodruff and his writing on the book of Revelation to help, help you understand these uh, passages and these illustrations. And this is the, the little illustration that you've now seen many, many, many times. All mankind is in bondage to sin. Until one is baptized into Christ, at that point, they are washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And we have entrance then into the city where we have access to the tree of life. The tree of life is representative of Christ. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, When we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us from all sin. In the church, we walk in the light of his word. We walk in the light of the forgiveness that we have. The light represents our sinless condition separated from sin because we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we have a right to that tree of life that sustains us spiritually. We are continually cleansed from our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 7 says. We enter the gates of the city through the blood of the Lamb. We'll look at the next verse when we come back in just a minute. Okay, back to verse 14 again one more time. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. We enter in to a special relationship to God in this holy city when we are baptized into Christ, when our robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we come into this special relationship to God where we have a safe place. It is the, it's the only safe place in this world that is dark with sin. Remember Revelation chapter 7 verse 14? These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You remember that all those weeks ago now that we studied that passage? We, we come into this special place. You see, the book of Revelation from, from the first chapter to the end is helping us to see just how significant the church is in God's scheme of things. It's the only place where there is safety in the world. We come out of the tribulation of the world of tribulation into this special relationship to God when we enter. Now, outside of that, he says in verse 15, look at this, are the dogs and the sorcerers 
and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who practices lying. The proper application of this verse in this context in the book of Revelation has to do with those that are false teachers. This is a reference back to the whore that rides the beast. And she is the mother of harlots. She has spawned all of the false religions that exist in the world today. False religion is considered by God to be as a dog or a sorcerer or an immoral person. You remember when you follow a false religion, you commit spiritual adultery. When you follow a false religion, you murder the truth. When you follow false religion, you are an idolater. When you follow false religion, you practice lying. Now, if you want to see an illustration of what a sorcerer is in false religion, let me suggest to you that you can tune in to some of the fancy programs that are offered in the name of Christianity today that beg for your money and provide for you all kinds of proofs, quote, unquote, of their genuine relationship to God by their sorcery. Uh, do I need to get any more specific than that? Let me remind you that dogs, as much as you love them, and I was saying the other day that um, I've learned in over 30 years as a pulpit minister that I can say just about anything about anybody at any time, and even though you may not like it, you will, uh, you'll forgive me. But if I say anything about your dog, you will not forgive me. So I have to be careful with this verse. I have to tell you that as much as you love your dog, your dog is not terribly discerning. Is that okay? Is that fair? That's true. Uh, dogs, as smart as they are, are a little dim on some things. Uh, their sensibilities about things are different than human sensibilities. Um, dogs like to do things that uh, human beings find uh, um, well, gross is a word that comes to mind religious people there are religious people who are dogs who are, are um, a little can I say dim when it comes to spiritual things and that's the description I'm not giving you. That's the description that comes through the Holy Spirit. They're not discerning about the things that represent true spirituality. And they go after um, the lusts of the flesh. Uh, we had, um, I don't want to get too far off the track here, but we had a dog in our family for a number of years that uh, my family dearly loved as a member of the family, an Australian shepherd. But I tell you what, that, that dog, if there, if, if, if there was food around and you weren't careful, that dog had that food. It doesn't matter how much he loved you or how much you loved him. If you were not on guard for half a second with a piece of steak, that dog had that, that food. Spiritually speaking, there are the dogs who are outside of the church. What he's talking about here are the people who profess to be religious who, whose appetites consume them with their religious, spiritual sorcery, their immoral idolaters. That's, that's what he's saying. They're outside of the Lord's church. And John is told, verse 16, from the Lord, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Again, I want to say to you that uh, in looking at these two verses, the answer to unraveling it is found at the end of verse 17. Let the one who wishes to take of the water of life without cost. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The bride is the church. 
the Holy Spirit which produced the word and the church which spreads the word offers the water of life in the world that we live in today. To understand this verse, you've got to see that the water of life is flowing out of the church into the world. That's the, that's the job that the church has in this world. That's its primary function. Really, everything else is, is unnecessary unless that is accomplished. The water of life, the gospel, is shared with the world. You see, we cannot be talking about heaven here because then it would necessitate for someone to go to heaven to drink of the water of life, and the water of life is clearly representing that which spiritually brings us into the right relationship to God, the gospel here. So now let's go back to verse 16. Jesus is testifying to the churches, just as we saw in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and chapter 2. This is the message to the church of Christ. He says, I'm the root and the descendant. Now, that is against nature. You don't have something to being the root and the seed because Jesus was the seed of David at the same time, but spiritually, that's the way that it works. Jesus existed before David, and Jesus is the descendant of David. How could that be possible? Well, spiritually speaking, that is in, indeed the case. He's the root and the descendant of David. David comes from Jesus, and Jesus is the descendant of David. You know that to be true biblically. The morning star, here's a it makes me wonder sometimes when I read these kind of expressions in God's Word whether or not we get our expression superstar from the biblical expression. When we talk about a superstar in sports or a movie actor, we're talking about a, a, a person who is larger than life. Jesus is the bright morning star. He is the huge spiritual influence. He's, he outshines even David. And Revelation twenty two seventeen says, let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Here again, we have Lonnie Woodruff's illustration for us. The water of life, the book of Revelation tells us, flows from the throne of God in the Lord's church. That's where it's flowing. And so we, we partake of that water of life when we become obedient to the gospel. Jesus said in, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, or verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And then verse 18, we have this stern warning. I'm going to challenge you to uh, think about the many times that you've probably heard uh, verse 18 applied and uh, and see if it's been applied properly after we uh, discuss this when we come back right after this message. Now, I know you've heard this verse many times before. Let's read it again. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Now, most of the time when I've heard this passage used, it's been applied to the entire Bible. And while I believe that that principle is true, what John is, is talking about here, or what John is revealing to us in verse 18, is most properly applied only to the book of Revelation. And, and you can see that in, in the terminology that is, that is used here. When we hear the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation, if we add to that, God adds to us the plagues. And he's talking about a spiritual relationship that we have. We're to take God's word, we're to take the book of Revelation, and we're not to add anything to the visions that we have received here. Now, that's not what the religious world does. In fact, the religious world violates this all of the time, and because of that, they they receive the plagues. And that takes us all the way back to chapter 15. Remember this in our study of chapter 15? 
Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. This is the wrath that God pours out upon people who refuse to be obedient to his word, who add to his word. Chapter 16 and verse 1 said this, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And we uh, noted last time when we studied this together, when we studied the wrath of God being poured out, that, that the earth was representative of people. The first angel went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth, representing people. And it says, the scripture says there, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. This is a reference to people who are not committed to God, even though may, they may be co committed to quote-unquote Christianity. They're committed to a tradition or a teaching that does not come from the scriptures. And God's wrath is poured out upon them. It's symbolic of the pain and the anguish that sin causes those who are disobedient while they're here on earth. If you refuse to obey God's word, if you know what it says and you refuse to obey it, you're going to suffer some consequences. It's, it's going to be a loathsome and malignant sore for you. He says in that chapter, let me remind you again, that the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Those who don't believe in what God's word teaches are dead spiritually. Again, in the book of Revelation, sea has reference to people and uh, blood in, in the water is a reference to the fact that the spiritual water that people are drinking is dead. That's a reference of dead spiritual water. These are rivers and springs that represent the abundant teachings of those who try to direct people's lives, but not according to what the scriptures teach. And that, that's dead water. And then he says in, in chapter 16, verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl onto the rivers and the springs of the waters, and they became blood. Again, that spiritual teaching that people swallow up kills them spiritually and furthermore the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to 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 men to to scorch men uh, back in the book of revelation often we see these lights representing spiritual entities the gospel is light christians are to walk in the light the preaching of the gospel burns some people. Men were scorched, he says in verse 9, with the fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. You, you know, when we studied this section, I, I mentioned that some people don't like what the Bible teaches. On, on the subject of immorality, for example, our culture does not want to hear that it is immoral to engage in certain kinds of behavior, sexual behavior. We'll use that as an illustration. But when you know that fornication is immoral in the eyes of God and you refuse to repent of that, you suffer the consequences. I know people who have engaged in immoral lifestyles who are miserable. They are burning up in every sense of the word. There are physical problems and disease associated with their immorality. There are mental problems that are associated with their immorality. There are societal problems. There's rejection from people because that's what he's talking about here. This is the plague that God pours out upon those who refuse to accept his word. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Here we have another proof that we're talking about the church in the last part of the book of Revelation and not our eternal abode. Because once we get to heaven, you don't lose your place in God's presence. The tree of life is representative of the life-sustaining message and relationship that we have in Christ. In the holy city, we have access to the tree of life. But if we add to God's word, 
if we take away from God's word, he will refuse, he, he will remove us from that holy city just as he removed Adam and Eve from the tree of life in the garden. That's the consequences. So you can see the plagues being poured out on the Christian world, quote unquote, when they're disobedient to God, they suffer from these plagues. And that's what we're talking about in these two verses. Chapter uh, 22 and verse 20 says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen, come Lord Jesus. This is the third time in this context that he's talked about coming quickly. When Jesus returns, it's all over with. There will not be a second chance. There will not be a kingdom established where another plan of salvation for a thousand years will be offered to men in the world. It's all over with when he comes again. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. That's what we need is grace. And I want to summarize what we've been talking about when we come back in just a minute. If you need any kind of Bible study materials, go to scripturesay.com today. In all of our study of all of these interesting symbols, in all of our study of the book of Revelation, it would not be helpful at all to have that knowledge and do nothing with it in terms of our obedience to God. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. What we've learned in our study of the book of Revelation is that we have salvation from our sins in a very special relationship to, the, to, to God in the, in the holy city, which is the bride of Christ. And we enter that by our obedience to him. And we must first believe that he is the answer to our sins. And we enter that city by washing our robes in the blood of the lamb. And we, we turn away from our sins Acts 17 says, God has overlooked times of ignorance and, and is now declaring that all men everywhere must repent. And we, we must repent of our sins to enter into that city because nothing unclean enters there. We, we repent of our sins and we're washed of our sins based upon our confession of Christ. When we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and we're willing to confess that before men, then we're we're fit subjects for baptism, which is, according to the Bible, for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Saul, who became the apostle Paul, was told in Acts 22, 16, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. When our sins are washed away, then we enter into that special city, the holy city, that city that that will last for all eternity. The kingdom is transferred over to God, Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians. But we enter that city in the here and the now, and we live faithfully. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive a crown of life. If we have studied the book of Revelation and you understand everything that it is taught, and you don't understand what I've said in the last minute and a half, then the study will not profit you. But if you understand how important it is that you take what you've learned and apply it to your own life and your own obedience, and you receive the forgiveness that God offers through the blood of Christ, then that knowledge will help you to live faithfully in God's presence for all eternity. And we'll be back in just a minute. And you didn't think I could do it. I didn't think he could do it. <laughs> but he did it, and, and the message is clear. I hope it is clear to you, and I hope that you will apply it to your lives, but not only to your own life, but I hope that you will take this information that you can, you can get off of our website at scripturesay.com and use it to help others apply this message of, of the book of Revelation, which is so important to Christ, so important to His church, so important to God and to us as Christians today. I hope you'll do that. And until next week, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.